I really focus on the human health aspects of my work. That's the part that really interests me, uh, making sure that, you know, uh, the environment is not harming people is something that I think is really important. PFAS are a group of man-made organic chemicals uh, that have actually been around since about the 1940s, um, but only recently have scientists begin to realize how widespread they are in terms of contamination and at what low levels they can cause health problems in humans. Lithium cobalt oxide nanosheets are one type of nanomaterial that we study in our lab. Lithium cobalt oxide is often used in lithium ion batteries that power our cell phones, our laptops, and even our electric vehicles. But unlike the systems that we have for recycling lead acid batteries, we currently lack a national recycling infrastructure for lithium ion batteries. And this provides a potential for spent battery waste to enter into our environment and our aquatic systems through leaching from landfills or from improperly disposed of batteries. So myself and other grad students in Dr. Clapper's lab are looking at this and other industrially relevant nanomaterials to see how they might impact aquatic organisms with the goal of redesigning these particles so that they can retain their desired function but have reduced or eliminated toxicity. At SFS, my main project that I've been working on is um, a collaboration between the McClellan Lab, uh, the Newton Lab, and also uh, Val Klump's lab, uh, who's the dean of the school. Um, he's a geochemist and um, so we are working with him along with the microbiology side um, that Sandra and Ryan's labs bring to the table to better understand the interplay between sediment and microbial pollutants um, in the Milwaukee River system that are associated with rain events. So they actually are a very useful group of chemicals, whether firefighting foams, nonstick coatings on pans, waterproofing on fabrics, um, even as far down as the uh, electrical, uh, like circuit making industry will use them. They're a wonderful lubricant and they're really protective coatings as well. They're really a huge part of our everyday life, but they're engineered so that they never break down. So. All the chemicals that have been released since the 1940s are still out in the environment. Um, so pretty much every person alive today has been exposed to these chemicals and has them present in their blood. I look at how different nanomaterials impact zebrafish, tiny crustaceans, and an aquatic fly species that spends its larval stage underwater. Using the techniques in our lab, I can look at genetic and chemical-based snapshots of what's happening inside those organisms, and often you can see things here that you wouldn't normally see just by looking at them from the outside, so it's a kind of early warning system. Some of the impacts I've noticed so far have been interferences with cardiovascular function, disruptions to circadian rhythm, which is important for behavior and overall health, as well as potential impacts to reproduction. Um, so every bacteria has a unique uh, sequence of DNA, just like humans do. Um, and by understanding specific bacteria that may be associated with specific um, animal intestines or animal guts, um, we can detect the DNA from those bacteria in the water. So we know that there's a specific uh, genetic sequence from a Bacteroides bacteria that's associated with a human a gastrointestinal tract. And so when we detect that in the water, we know with a high degree of confidence that it came from a human fecal source. And the same is true of ruminant, um, so cow markers. So we have a specific other sequence of a related bacteroides, but genetically distinct, um, that we can detect these small changes in the DNA sequence. And when we detect that one, we know that it came from a cow source. Um, and again, that's typically how we identify these urban and rural inputs because our expectation is that there isn't a lot of cow DNA coming in to the river in Milwaukee. Um, but we know that there are a lot of um, cattle farming operations up in the northern parts of the watershed. Um, so this year, my focus has been on biosolids and uh, particularly since PVAS do tend to accumulate in biosolids, what are the implications of using biosolids as fertilizer, spreading them on farmland? Um, so we're looking at uh, how they behave when exposed to water, and then using that information to work on modeling their transport through soils uh, to see how much of uh, a danger is posed by putting biosolids on land, uh, start to get an idea of what an acceptable concentration might be in biocells that would allow for 
topsoil and water levels to stay below recommended limits. So it's kind of a first look at how that might be addressed um, in terms of setting limits in biosolids. Uh, so since these chemicals are just starting to become regulated, uh, even in water, uh, people are looking into where what else they need to start regulating to keep people safe. Nano-enabled technologies hold a lot of promise across a wide range of industries and different applications, including agriculture and medicine and a lot more. What we want to do is be able to harness the potential that they have while being smart about it at the same time. In better understanding how these particles impact different species, we can work towards redesigning these particles so that they retain their desired function, but they have reduced or limited toxicity towards aquatic organisms. We examined a lot of the large rain events that occurred in the Milwaukee area and, and sampled them really intensely. So we were able to look more carefully at the timing of these different pollutants that come through the river system and into the harbor and into Lake Michigan. And what we found is that there's two very distinct pulses um, of pollutants. First comes a sort of urban source of pollutants um, and this is more associated with potentially leaking sewer systems um, or on the rare occasion that we have a combined sewer overflow. And then later on in the storm, we have this sort of rural input. And that's from the large areas of the watershed of the Milwaukee River that are far north of Milwaukee. There's a lot of sediment pollution that still comes through with that rural pulse. And so um, when we're talking about the overall health of the watershed and managing both of these pollutants, we have to really be looking at sources that are within the city as well as up in the upstream parts of the watershed.